I guess many of you might have not read it.
he, he, was, and he talked, uh, and then he told me that you are Korean. <laughs> so I asked him, what does that mean? <laughs> so he said that, you know, um, the way of solving the problem in the United States, uh, when you have a problem with the authority in the United States, that's a different from the, the way of uh, you solve the problem in South Korea. So uh, uh, what I did was, uh, I don't know what you do uh, like with a client uh, who has a problem with a, a professor. Maybe you would ask like, uh, yes, what kind of uh, problems you had and what he did and what you did and also try to find out a good solution to go to the uh, solving the problems or the conflict. But what I did was a lot different. What I did was persuading her not to go to that professor to suck it up. <laughs> The reason for that is, that's the best solution in South Korea. Uh, if you go to South Korea, ask 100 people, and what would you do when you have a conflict with the professor? And 99 per, uh, people would say, suck it out. <laughs> so that's the best, that's the best way. So, so Dr. Kelly told me that, no, 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 but that might be the best way in South Korea, but not in the United States. So he taught me what to do with the uh, client. So I learned that, wow, yes, I speak different language, but at the same time, culturally, I am different. I didn't notice that kind of things, why I'm doing counseling in that, with that client, uh, but implicitly, I don't know, it's just, uh, unconsciously, I was doing counseling in Korean way. So I learned that, uh, I noticed that, and, and I started to admit that I'm different. Before that, I, I try to be just like American, but after that, I admitted that I'm not American, and I am Korean, so I am different, I have different culture, and different language, so I need to realize that uh, uh, or I need to be sensitive in my counseling how differently I behave or how different value that I have in my counseling. So that was a kind of like a first moment uh, of the journey to the multicultural counseling. So I guess if you work with the uh, multicultural uh, clients, maybe you need to be sensitive also. You are different from them. Don't try to like uh, uh, act like your your client or speak just like your client because you are different from them. So you need to admit that you're a different person. And and the second stop of the journey was I really want you to understand what clients say. And um, maybe I would say that hmm, they're speaking different language than I am. So uh, it was very difficult for me to understand what client says. And so I, the first thing I wanted to do in my counseling sessions was try to understand them. And, but it was a very interesting uh, and surprising to me, actually, uh, the first uh, semester of a practicum in career <coughs> center, at that time, Dr. Sampson was my uh, supervisor, and he watched it on my uh, counseling session, and, and after that, I had a supervision session with him, and he came to me with a big smile, and I was very uh, uh, worried about what, what he would say to me, but he had a very big smile and uh, he uh, started to tell me that, wow, I never seen uh, a counselor like you and before. You are the, one of the best counselor in the world. So I asked him, why? <laughs> I know that's a weird, dumb question. 
<laughs> but he told me that I, I, I was not able to understand why he told me that I am the, one of the best counselor. So he started to pointing out some of the, the good stuff I have done very well in counseling session. And, um, and then uh, after I go home, I just keep pondering, what was that? And why, what kind of uh, made him feel like I am the good counselor? I'm bragging right now. <laughs> and, um, and I thought that I finally uh, I learned that, yes, maybe uh, he thought, uh, the Dr. Sampson uh, thought that I am the good counselor because I had uh, uh, maybe the good attitude toward the counselor, uh, client because because I was not able to understand my client, what I could do in a counseling session was paraphrasing, summarizing, and asking questions, and checking with him or checking with the client whether I understood him or, uh, or, or her correctly. So that's what I all, uh, that's all what I did in counseling <laughs> session. <laughs> yes. So, so because of that type of like uh, the basic uh, counseling skills, I have tried to apply in my counseling session, and uh, and also the attitude, like showing uh, my clients, yeah, I really like to understand because because I don't understand here, <laughs> Not because um, just a uh, different cultural background is it is about the a language. Uh, I really like to understand you, so. So I, uh, from that experience, I learned that counseling is not about language. Counseling is about attitude, counselor's attitude. What kind of like your uh, attitude you have about your client. If you really want to understand uh, your clients. So that's the kind of things that I've learned from that uh, experience. And one of my, uh, friend in Korea, he also studied in the United States uh, uh, to be a counselor, and uh, he shared his experience. Uh, it's a hilarious um, story. He told me that uh, it was a, the, just like the first uh, session, counseling session in the United States. But he really worried about uh, his speaking English. So what he did was he read uh, the doc, uh, Carl Rogers, uh, the book of uh, Counseling and Psychotherapy. So he memorized all the verbatims of Dr. Uh, Carl Rogers. <laughs> so he didn't look at the, all the client's things. He just uh, read the, all the, uh, the Dr. Um, Carl Rogers uh, verbatim. So he memorized all of these things. And then the first session, no matter what client says, he just repeated what the Carl Rogers said. <laughs> So that's what he did in the uh, first counseling session. And after he got out of the, counts, uh, the counseling room, the faculties and the students all watched it, his counseling through the one-way mirror, and all applause. <laughs> wow, that's the wonderful counseling. <laughs> so, it's the same thing. <laughs> counseling is not about language. It is about attitude and it is about basic skills and also uh, heart toward the client. So that was a kind of a big learning for me. But the second semester of uh, the career center practicum, uh, at that time, uh, uh, Dr. Peterson was a supervisor and he, uh, after he <coughs> watched my uh, counseling session, he came to me and he nicely uh, talked to me that you need to improve your English. Oh. <laughs> well, I, he didn't say it that way, but he's nicely uh, talked to me. And then I learned that, yes, language is still important. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but uh, it's uh, uh, counseling, uh, multicultural counseling, and also just the counseling is not about the language. It's about um, basic skills and uh, attitude. <coughs> And the third stop of the journey was, am I a Korean? 
Um, that means um, I uh, had a couple of Korean clients when I uh, did an internship at the Penn State. Um, that uh, the, all of the Korean clients uh, stopped coming back after second session. So I was wondering, what is that? Because I am Korean, and uh, I thought that I would do better with the Korean clients. <coughs> and also, I uh, did a counseling in Korean with the Korean students. So I thought that I could share many more things with the Korean <coughs> clients, but um, they didn't like it. So I, even after I go back to South Korea, uh, first couple of like months, I had a difficult time with the, uh, the clients in Korea. So I try to think about what is the problem with me and what kind of uh, things I'm doing wrong in, uh, with the Korean clients. And I found out that uh, maybe the things that I have learned in the United States maybe would not apply, apply to South Korean clients. Or, I don't want to say that all of them, but some of the skills or some of the way of counseling or some of the theories would not fit South Koreans. So I started thinking about, yes, then I need to understand about Koreans. I thought that I know, but it was not. Uh, I guess that may be the, the most uh, <coughs> uh, mistakes that uh, counselors can make uh, with a client was, I know you. That's the biggest mistake that I that we can have about the clients. Once you assume that you know your clients, then you're going to stop trying to understand your clients. So that was a kind of mistake that I made with the Korean clients. I thought that I know them, but it was not. So I tried, uh, the, another thing that I had to do with the Korean, Korean clients was I tried to understand them. The same thing, paraphrasing, summarizing, and uh, checking with them whether I understood them correctly or not. So that was a kind of things that I learned from uh, this, uh, the experience with the Korean clients. Um, so I guess um, from these three stops of the journey, the, what I learned was uh, the being a counselor, also being a multicultural counselor, uh, is not about the language. It's about your uh, attitude about the client, and also try to understanding about your uh, clients no matter what kind of uh, background you have and no matter what kind of background your client has. So, uh, uh, yes, this is the kind of the, uh, the journey I uh, experienced. So, um, right track or not. I'd like to share some of the, uh, the research findings that I have done. Uh, uh, in Korea, and uh, because uh, I learned that I don't know about Korean, so I started to study more about to understand uh, psychological aspect of Korean uh, clients and also Korean people. So here are some of the uh, research findings that I got. Uh, the, and I want to ask you, when Koreans have personal or family issues, who do you think they would go to for help? <coughs> it's a question to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do they yeah. suck it up? Like do they suck it up? Suck it up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, might be. The grandparent, maybe? Yeah. The grandparents, the grandparents, who else? Maybe yeah. an elder from the community? elder from community? Yes. Um, the reason why I ask this question is because you have kind of like a myth about uh, Asian culture. 
when you uh, learn about Asian culture as collectivistic and also family oriented, but there is a, some of the misunderstanding about what is family orient orientation in South Korea or other uh, countries in Asia. I don't know exactly in other countries, but especially in South Korea. Family, uh, the Koreans are family oriented. That is true. But it's a different way uh, than you think about. Uh, when they have a, a personal and uh, family issues, uh, they don't go to their family. They don't want to talk about their problems with their families. When you think about, well, Koreans are family oriented, so they're going to share everything with the families. No, they're not going to do that. The reason for that is they feel that, uh, they think that I don't want to be a burden to my family because of my problem. So they don't go to uh, their family with their problems. So I've interviewed some of the, uh, uh, some uh, like 12 moms uh, for a qualitative study and asked them what, where you go when you have a difficulties with children or something like that. They said that, well, I don't want to discuss uh, my children's <coughs> problem with my friends, my, my parents, or other my relatives. I usually go to the book to get some wisdom or to get some hint what to do with that. Or they go to the professional advisors or counselors or something like that. So uh, they feel like if they have a problem, like family issues, they feel like it is shame. So I don't want to share my shame with other people. So, um, so when you work with the when you work with the uh, Asian clients, I don't know if you see the South Korean, especially uh, if you uh, ask your client, well, why don't you go to your family and uh, discuss about your issues? They will help you and because they're supportive and so you need to family support. I, the Koreans would say that, yes, I know they support me, but I don't want to share my problem with them because I don't want to be a burden to them. So if you ask your uh, South Korean uh, clients to go to the family to discuss about your problem, they're not going to do that. So maybe talking with the clients will be more comfortable for them than talking with their families. And the, the second one is, which style of counseling would Koreans prefer, prefer to have, directive or non-directive? Directive? That's what you learn, right? <laughs> Yes, uh, they uh, like to have a more directive counseling and because uh, when they go to counselor, uh, they have a, uh, they feel like I'm going to a teacher. So they always learn from, uh, learn something from a counselor. So uh, you need to teach them uh, or you need to give uh, like information or something like that to the uh, Korean uh, clients. Uh, but at the same time, you need to give them time to think about your advice. So what I did uh, in my study was I compared uh, three different uh, counseling uh, method. And the first one was a directive one. So the Korean college students, they felt that directive counseling is the most effective than other, uh, other method of counseling. But they said that, it's very ironical, they said that the directive counseling is the least useful. So that means they feel like that when they get something, good information from counselor, wow, I learned something. But if you push them to do it, then they will feel like, oh, well, I don't know whether I'm going to use it or not. 
So you need to give them to think about what you said and what your advice. So they uh, they need to. Uh, uh, I don't. I, I forgot the, the right words for that one. Uh, vocabulary, English vocabulary. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a process. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, they need to process that uh, type of uh, learning from the counselors. Then they will feel that, wow, the counseling was very useful. So uh, directive and non-directive uh, also need to be in a one uh, counseling session, not just the one directive counseling. <laughs> and our Korean moms, tiger moms, have you heard about tiger moms? Yes, that, I guess that was a very the popular book in the United States. Um, what do you think, the tiger moms? <laughs> what is the definition of tiger mom? Straight? Yeah, straight, very straight. High expectation, yeah, giving them a lot of pressure and push them uh, to do more uh, or in their academics or something like that. In terms of that, yes, Korean moms are tiger moms. <laughs> yeah, they are strict, especially in academics. And also, they are, they have a very high expectation. Uh, especially in uh, academic. Um, here's Dr. Viper, and he and I uh, did a one study and with the other research team, and uh, we uh, asked the, the Korean moms and uh, the moms in the U.S. asked them to uh, rate their children's giftedness. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we, what we found out was the big difference of a uh, mid score, average score, and the gifted rating scale. Uh, which uh, mom uh, rated higher, do you think? Americans. Americans, yes. So, Korean moms, they rated their children in the, on the giftedness as very low. Even though they think that they, their children are gifted, but they do not rate on their children uh, the assessment as their children as gifted because they have a high expectation. So if, when you see, uh, I don't, uh, I don't want to say that uh, Asians are all math genius. Uh, that's a big uh, uh, stereotype of uh, Asian people. But I guess you have seen that uh, many Asian students in the United States they are uh, excelled in uh, in math. Uh, so they look like genius and gifted, but still their moms don't think that their children are gifted because they have a high expectation. But at the same time, they are strict, but at the same time, they sacrifice everything for their children. So I interviewed uh, the Korean moms and asked about uh, until when you are going to support your children. Maybe in, in the United States, uh, the mom would say that maybe graduate high school, then college, they need to do by themselves or uh, they need to earn their money. But the Korean mom said that even after marriage. Yeah. And then Korean students, high school students, uh, usually stay up till like 12 o'clock midnight, uh, not at home, outside of home, or even some in the school or um, private institute, they stay up till like even uh, 12th grade, they, st they have to stay up at like 2 o'clock in the morning and they com come back home. And, but their parents don't go to sleep. They wait until they come back and prepare food for them. So they sacrifice everything for their children. So if you work with the, uh, the mothers or parents uh, from uh, Korea, probably if you ask 
do something for their children, they're ready to do it. So if you consult with them like um, about their children's problem, if you uh, give them an advice, well, maybe you need to do this kind of things for your children, they're ready to do it. So sometimes um, they uh, sometimes overact <laughs> uh, or do too much, uh, but they are ready to do it. So it's a very uh, easy to collaborate with the, uh, the Asian or especially Korean parents because they are ready to sacrifice everything for their children. So that was the kind of things uh, I've learned. The last thing I want to share about was openness uh, to experience. I guess uh, this is the, the one thing, if you ask me to choose one thing to, to learn from my journey, was openness to experience. If you assume that you know everything about client, and after that your <coughs> counseling would be go astray. So, uh, openness to experience. Try to understand more about your clients. Try to understand other things about your clients. That would help you to be a better counselor, better psychologist, I guess. So this is it. This is my presentation. Thank you.